If you work for or ally yourselves with the high place vipers and hypocrites and thieves and polluters and repressors and assassins, you are trash. I am sick of these so-called leaders who are leading us to the slaughter. I'm sick of their blow-dry hairdos, their sleek, beefy, money... Their sleek, beefy, money-fed smiles, their pinstripe suits, and their tight ass struts down the corridors of power. I'm sick of the sight of them, and I hate them with all the passion of my humanity. Communism, ladies and gentlemen, I say it without flinching, communism in Eastern Europe, Russia, China, Mongolia, North Korea, and Cuba brought land reform and human services, a dramatic bettering of the living conditions of hundreds of millions of people on a scale never before or never since witnessed in human history. And that's something to appreciate. Communism transformed desperately poor countries into societies in which everyone had adequate food, shelter, medical care, and education. And some of us who come from poor families who carry around the hidden injuries of class are very impressed, are very, very impressed by these achievements and are not willing to dismiss them as economistic. To say that socialism doesn't work is to overlook the fact that it did work and it worked for hundreds of millions of people. To say that socialism doesn't work is to overlook the fact that it did work and it worked for hundreds of millions of people. But what about the democratic rights that they lost? We hear U.S. leaders talking about restoring democracy to the communist countries. But these countries... When the Sandinistas came to power in Nicaragua 10 years ago, filled with ideals and hopes for their nation and their people, they discovered a very awful thing. And it wasn't about themselves, even though they had to do it to themselves. It was about that capitalist encirclement. They discovered that they needed a secret police. They discovered that they needed a security police. Because all around them, coming in from two borders and within their own society, were acts of sabotage, espionage, attack, mercenary invasion, and the like. And they understood that if the revolution was going to survive, it would have to build up instruments of state power, instruments of coercion even. And these instruments, by the way, can make mistakes. And these instruments can not only make mistakes, they can commit some serious crimes. If there had been no invasion, if there had been no espionage, if there had been no attack, if there had been no white guard armies burning villages, there wouldn't have been a red army of that side. There wouldn't have been a Stalin, there wouldn't have been a KGB. If there hadn't been a CIA, there wouldn't have been a KGB. If there hadn't have been, if there hadn't been a, 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 a NATO encirclement, there wouldn't have been a Warsaw Pact. And to lose sight of that fact is to lose sight of an essential force of what was going on over those 70 years or 10 years. And if you want to know what the Soviet Union went through in its early years, just look at what Nicaragua went through in these 10 years and then multiply that by 10. Every single one of those countries was targeted. They were targeted by missiles, they were targeted by acts of espionage, they were targeted by, as I say, uh, economic embargo and all sorts of other forms of aggression. They were targeted by in in incredible propaganda barrages and the like. Unrelenting, unremitting. The most targeted socialist country in the world is not Nicaragua, was not Nicaragua, not even Cuba, it was the Soviet Union. All those missiles were pointing to the USSR. They still are, and they're still building those missiles, and they're refusing to negotiate those missiles. Mercenary armies, destruction of the productive facilities of society, more invasion, more sabotage, economic boycott, economic embargo, monetary embargo, technological embargo. It was better in Cuba than it was in Washington, D.C., where I live, and I walk down the street, and I see people in total misery and disorientation standing there begging for food, begging for money, sleeping in hallways. I see that in the richest country in the world. That's where it was better. And when you talk about freedom, that's freedom. 
That's oppression. When you talk about oppression, that's oppression. Sleeping in a doorway is oppression. You want to know what oppression is? Then sleep in the doorways of the land of the free and the home of the brave, and you'll know what oppression is. You want to know what oppression is? Then think about the guys who sit there wondering if they're going to blow their brains out because they can't pay the mortgage on their house and they can't feed their kids and they see the whole thing falling apart. If you convince somebody that there's a force out there that can threaten your survival, your children's survival, your community's survival, um, and you must act, then you will surrender your rights, you, you'll surrender more money in taxes. And but that expropriation of the third world has been going on for 400 years brings us to another revelation, namely that the third world is not poor. You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich. Mexico is rich. Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. But there's billions to be made there, to be carved out and be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European and North American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the coke, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, and the cheap labor. They have taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped, they're overexploited. Over the last 50 years, U.S. national security state, the U.S. national security state has been a key force in overthrowing reformist democratic governments in Guatemala, Guyana, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile under Allende, Iran under Mossadegh, Uruguay, Syria, Indonesia under Sukarno, Greece, twice in Greece, Argentina, twice, Haiti, Bolivia, and other countries. The U.S. has also been active in covert actions or proxy mercenary wars against popular revolutionary governments in Cuba, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Portugal, South Yemen, Nicaragua, Cambodia, East Timor, Western Sahara, and elsewhere. They've been active in forcibly overthrowing reformist governments in Egypt, Lebanon, Peru, Iran, Syria, and other countries. For decades, what, what's happened is that terrorism is now being used as the way the new, the, it's the new world communist menace. We hear about the world communist menace, and now it's terrorism, and it's the jihad that's now being used. For decades, we heard that we had to maintain massive military bases all over the world because the Soviet Union was an implacable, uh, implacable uh, enemy, relentless, was coming upon us, and this is why we needed these huge military budgets, and this is why we needed hundreds of military bases all over. And there were some of us who said, no, that's not the reason. That if the Soviet Union were to disappear, never thinking that it was going to disappear, but, but when, it, when it disappeared, the U.S. would still have these military bases all over the world. Now that position we took was untestable. We could not prove it. And yet every so often history allows you to run a test, a laboratory test. They actually remove a key ingredient and, 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 hold, and, and, and hold a constant. The Soviet Union was overthrown, collapsed, however you want to describe it. And what happened to U.S. policy? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. The U.S. military budget climbed at a rate higher today. It's climbing at a rate higher than during the Cold War. All those military bases have been kept. One or two were shut, and new ones have been opened in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, and in Central Asia. And we're talking about huge bases, huge ones. The one in Kosovo is, is, is huge. All the Cold War weapons will continue. One minute. And the U.S. has pursued wars of intervention, wars of control, more violently and more frequently than ever. And a whole host of new enemies have been conjured up. In the, in the years since the, since the end of the Cold War, we have invaded Panama and Grenada and, 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 and uh, pursued proxy wars in, in a variety of other countries. And we invaded Iraq twice now. 
and bombed Yugoslavia for 78 days around the clock uh, by that great, that great liberal Democrat, Bill Clinton. Um, there's no axis of evil. There's no communist country. There's no terrorist state that has a record of that kind of bloody interventionism. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the problem is right here. And we should look at what our rulers are doing to the people of the world and to ourselves. The empire feeds off the republic. 280 billion spent over there. Uh, the patricians expand the parameters of the empire. Um. Meanwhile, it gets bled. Athens, Athens is starved out so that Sparta can batten and become stronger and stronger. You see that every day in your newspapers. I go all over the country lecturing and every newspaper looks the same. City council considering cuts. Budget crises here. Um, county supervisors uh, uh, out running out of money. Uh, huge debt in the state. All that, we, we, are, we are impoverishing ourselves as we pursue what, what, my, what my friend Christopher Hitchens thinks are noble causes. <laughs>